going to ask um, each of the panelists to uh, just quickly, you know, maybe 30 seconds, tell us, um, you know, your name, where you're from, and if there's any particular form of LARP design that you specialize in, or, or what kinds of LARPs do you design? So we can just start here and work our way down. So I'm Jeff Dewald. This is my 30th anniversary year uh, writing and running LARPs. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I help bring the Boston community together, and I'm a big, big part of the intercon um, crowd, and you know it's an all LARP convention in the in the Boston area. Um, I write theater style LARPs, and I write them from five player games to 25 player games. Um, they, I, I hate the term secrets and powers, but that may be the term that you you recognize most, um, which is unfortunate because not all my games have secrets, not all my games have powers, but that's the sort of the style. And I've written about 20 games, and love to talk about it. Uh, my name is Emily Carebox. I started as a tabletop game designer and have moved into LARP. I like uh, primarily to write freeform LARP, um, which has scenes, intercut scenes, and meta techniques typically. Um, but I also have written a few sort of traditional theater style LARP, um, and I really like looking at all the different modalities. Um, uh, I'm Mark Now. My 25-year professional design career is in video games, uh, and then I've done a number of sort of 70, 80 player LARPs, one shots at Gen Con. Um, I guess my LARP area, I tend to explore the intersection between LARP and board games and LARP and uh, tabletop role-playing games, kind of mechanics and playing around with that. And then the other installation I have is an educational LARP at the Reagan Library, where kids are coming in and playing the cabinet during a crisis. Um, my name is uh, Eric Fatland, or Eric Fatland. <laughs> uh, so I'm from Norway, which means I'm also a bit involved in the Nordic LARP tradition. Uh, I've designed roughly 20 LARPs, and most of those have been one shots because that's what we used to do in the, in the Nordic tradition. But design one to play ones and then forget about it. Uh, and I used to really enjoy making the players cry. <laughs> so, deep, dark, and impressive uh, subject matter. The last few years, I'm kind of on a, on a mission to to contribute more joy and positivity <laughs> to the world. That's great, actually. It kind of leads me into the um, next question, but I'll, I'll introduce myself first. Um, my name is Cameron Betts. Um, I'm, uh, I'm from uh, the Boston area, and um, I'm mostly involved in interactive literature, uh, theater uh, games as well, although I do live combat games, and I do ARG LARPs uh, a lot as well. Um, so, uh, Eric, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do the other one. <laughs> um, Eric, um, you mentioned that you like to make, make players cry, and this sort of leads me into my first question, uh, which is uh, when, and this is going to be a question for everyone, but when you are designing a game, what is it that you are trying to get out of it? We can start, we can start with you, and we'll go okay. in the opposite direction. Okay. <laughs> well, for me, the get not design more off than design. I mean, not, not in general necessarily, but in my practice, uh, which by which I mean that I don't always have a clear intent uh, or a clear idea. Now I'm going to accomplish this by using those methods. It's often a bit more fussy, wizzy, washy kind of stuff, and then a few years later I realize, oh, so that's what that was about. <laughs> uh, an example was the Love You Roll Club, uh, held in 2001. Uh, I had done my military service as a scientist objector working in an NGO that worked for refugee rights. So I was very familiar with what the asylum reception system, the refugee reception system in Norway, and it sucked, it was, it was horrible. I met many people that run away from the Yugoslav wars and encountered a kind of a really brutal and inhuman and dehumanizing system. And that was emotionally really hard. I mean, I was 22 years old, I had to talk to people who were in kind of more or less life and, life and death situations every day. And so I made a lot where Norwegian, Swedes, Danes, Finns would pretend to be refugees from an imaginary Nordic war who had applied for a peace, of, uh, for asylum in a peaceful democratic country on the Balkans. And uh, we did that for five days. Um, and this was one of the last where people really cried afterwards. It was a dark and depressing dark. And I felt so much better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so for me, anyway, by, by projecting this, by finding resonance for the stuff that I've been struggling with in encountering the system, by showing it to others, showcasing it to others, that kind of made, made a lot make sense for me. Mark, why do you, why do you design? Sure, um, it, there's an interesting like sort of stylistic uh, difference between the two of us. Um, 
I, I, I often think of terms of designing away or designing toward. Uh, and so designing away, you've got some ideas, and you play around, you're saying, where's, where is this going? What is this? Uh, very often, I find myself designing toward, where I have got an idea that's fuzzy, and I'm willing to experiment. I do some design away, of course, but I, primarily, I think my mind is more designed toward. And so I've got some intent up front, and now I'm going to pick mechanics and pick things and, and try to design it in a way that leads in that direction. I guess a good example of that is we were playing Battlestar Galactica board game, and the idea was, can we, can we bring this out of the board game and take some of the things that it's about, about mistrust, about resource allocation, about tactical decisions, but also human interaction decisions about where things are going to be allocated, and can we turn this into an experience for 30, 40, 50, 60 people? And so that was, before we even started, that was the intent. And now I'm designing everything towards that, the themes of mistrust, the themes of how do we allocate our resources, who do we place in charge of leadership, who do we trust, who as a person am I going to get in the lead with and decide what we're going to do, and then constantly being out, having to deal with the various threats that are being presented to us. Um, so for me, very most often, it's I have a, a rough picture of the experience that I want to deliver, and now I'm assembling my toys in order to try to get there. So one of the <clears throat> base places for me, um, for my design, is uh, um, the story. What is the story that I'm trying to present? So what is the story that I'm trying to create a system that, to allow players to enact? Um, I was in one of the early, LARP, one of my early, earliest um, contacts with LARP was through the G Forum Collective. Um, I got to play some of their, ga their games in Finland and talk to some of the designers and they talked about having their ethic be we find a story thread and then we look for uh, mechanics or techniques or uh, activities for the players to do that are going to feed into that theme and support that. And they didn't care what it was. They weren't looking at the, the typical things that one would do, dice or you know, stats, whatever. Uh, it could be um, you're playing a game about an alcoholic family, so let's have a bottle of water here that represents an actual bottle of drink and put um, different events that could happen in that family's life and um, part of the mechanics are at the end of the turn you take a swig from the bottle and then you see what it is okay oh there's a car crash coming up um, so that you're aligning the mechanics and the, the story and um, for me the values that I come from are trying to um, for me it very much is about art and communication I look at games role play games particularly the role games as part of the larger uh, narrative uh, uh, tradition that humanity has. And it has different constraints, different placement, different interaction between the, the creator and the audience and the participants, but that's where it sits for me. So the stories that I gravitate towards putting into LARP are ones that are either very strong and resonant from the real world, history, literature, etc., or from my own life that I uh, either need to process a little bit and get out there or that I feel like might be helpful to share. Um, and also, particularly stories that aren't necessarily already represented, um, maybe in literature, maybe in, in games. In games, it's kind of easy, because there's a really lot of stories that aren't represented yet. Um, and uh, my three first games were <coughs> romance-themed, and that particularly came out of not actually the fact that romance wasn't particularly a strong theme in role-playing games at the time, in the games that I was playing. Uh, 10, 15 years ago. Um, but it was more about gender and um, embodying people who are of different genders in your play. There was an argument on the internet where someone said, I've never seen it and I don't really believe that someone could play a character of a different gender from themselves. <laughs> and I got all of them. Because uh, <laughs> for me, my, my play experience had been totally different from that. I had been playing for many years in a crazy freeform household where we lived together and played for 24 hours straight or whatever. We all had multiple characters and depth of world, and we were all playing characters that were different from us. And if it's if one can suspend your disbelief enough that you can play an elf or an orc in some strange fantasy world, why on earth can't you play someone who's like the people that you're around every day? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So that sort of launched me into making a game about two people who were of different, differing in some way. Romance seemed to be a good um, place to put that, two people on a date, and that started to <coughs> Starting from the stories that matter, uh, speaking about stories that maybe have to be represented in the same way that means. So when I started LARPing in the, the dawn of time when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, um, 
we didn't have the internet, we didn't have these connections, didn't even have an email. And um, a friend of mine came to me and he said, you're a sleazy tabletop GM, I need some help. And he showed me this character sheet. And he was in this weekend long murder mystery game. Um, and he said, I'm the killer, I need to figure out how I can pull this murder off um, in, right in front of everyone if possible and get away with it. And so he showed me the character sheet, he showed me the blue sheet, and I said, this is really cool, and, and started talking to him about plots, and we were talking about how all this worked, and, um, and he, he went off to play this game, and I was I anxiously awaiting the, the results. Did he, could he do it? Yes, he pulled off the murder. And I said, you know, I really have to get into this game. He says, I, I say, what do I have to do? Who do I have to talk to get into this game? And he said, you can't. He said, this weekend group, this group runs these weekend murder mysteries for their friends. Um, they always have enough people to fill the hotel. It was a big old Victorian mansion in southern Vermont. Um, and, um, and no one ever drops off the list. <laughs> and so, so the, well, I started writing LARP because I wanted to play. <laughs> um, after all, I'd seen one character sheet. I'd seen one blue sheet. I had a brand new 128K Macintosh with two floppy drives. How hard could this be? <laughs> uh, and uh, six weeks later or so, I had sex, drugs, and rock and roll done. And then it was, all right, well, um, you know, my, my wife at the time, um, she was involved in, in stuff and she was doing the editing stuff. So I said, all right, well, now we have to find 16 other people who will do this. <laughs> and so, so uh, we tapped all our friends and, and, and that and convinced one of them to let us use her house. And, um, and we ran this game. And it was brilliant and it was fun and people had a great time. And then they turned around and said, when's the next one? Um, and other people heard about the game and they said, can you run this for us? And so, so I became the person who was right, running these LARPs again and again as needed. I actually sold some of them on the internet, leading to some interesting stories and interesting connections that are here today. Um, Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll, by the way, I ran at Brandeis Festival of LARP just a few months ago. Um, it was the 30th anniversary run of the game. Um, the game had gone from a, uh, a contemporary game to a period piece, and most of, the, most of the players in the game were not as old as the game itself. Um, so, so I'm designing to tell these stories that are in my head. Um, I'm designing to watch the stories that come out of these people because it's always better than what I put into it. Um, I'm doing it because I love to play and I love to encourage people to play and I want them to, to have an opportunity to do so. Um, at Brandeis again, my daughter, um, uh, there was a character in the game who was written as pregnant because my wife at the time was pregnant with my daughter. And so at the 30th anniversary of the run, my daughter played a character who was best friends with the woman who was the character who was pregnant. Um, so she played the game twice. You know, <laughs> um, I'm writing to, so that I can watch these people tell these stories. I'm, I'm writing so that I can give them a dilemma, some interesting, challenging decision that they have to make in game that's not black and white. It's gray. What do I do? How do I handle this? And, and, and put them on the hot seat. And then watch what happens. And, and as, as I've been writing more and more, I'm, I'm not playing anymore because there's a, a lot of LARP around, but, but I'm GMing less. I'm stepping away and making games that don't require a GM so that I can just watch the, the magic that happens. And I get to see these beautiful things happen um, in the games that I write. Thank you. So um, this is a round table. If anyone has questions at any point, you're welcome to raise your hand. I'll call on you. Um, please. Please do, or he doesn't have questions. Questions or comments? Yes. Um, you talk very much about the kind of stories that you want to tell and how you want to convey and so on and stuff. How do you balance a uh, player uh, agency to kind of do their own thing versus your vision? Because if you go to one way, you're, you're the jerk artist with this vision that's stomping on people. And you go the other way, you're not getting what you need to be happy, as you said, about what happened. So how do you deal with the realization at times that you're not telling the story you want to tell, and how do you adjust? Oh, I can answer that. Well, I who has an answer as well. So, so, so uh, I own the game until I call game on, at which point it's not my game anymore. The players, whatever they do, that's what happens. That's what's right. So, so you have to give away your baby. You have to let it 
let it breathe. And as I said, sometimes you'll see stories that come out of it that, that were never, that were not in your head, but are brilliant. Yeah, Eric, I think also had an answer. Yeah. If, I, if I have kind of very, I mean, I work, work with logs where uh, I often have more than 20 players. I'm usually not in the room. So if you were in a free form space, for example, it works differently. But in the space I work in, if I have an idea, I want this scene to happen, these characters to meet the zone. I try to generalize it. Uh, what kind of environment would produce scenes like that? Uh, would encourage people to play characters a bit like that? And then that they might take it somewhere else. But it's the, to, the, the framing that produces this stuff is the interesting part, not the stuff itself. That's up to the players. I have a sort of a mechanical approach to it. Um, several of the LARPs that I've written are uh, verge into the tabletop space, where in, in tabletop a lot of times you're creating your characters custom every time. Not to, not in all LARP, but many LARP, you're, you're given a, a character and a background to start with, and then you play. Um, and so having the, the situation and elements of the story defined help make the, the story arc very clear to all the players in these games. But then exactly what the characters are, exactly what the dilemmas are that they're facing, exactly what their is important to their characters, typically gets created by them at the beginning of play. So then it's them being able to fill in the story structure that's been, that's offered to them rather than me telling them exactly what it's going to be. And if that story structure doesn't appeal to them, that's that's great. Then they can just play a different game. <laughs> but if it, if it appeals, then they have they're supported in being able to make their own version. Sure, and I. Um more generally, uh, if there are things you absolutely need to have happen, then you specify them, and otherwise it's the art of how you make a shape. You know, how do I tone-wise and mechanics-wise and positioning and everything else shape this in a way so that, and, and also player incentives, like what do the mechanics or the interactions or the things that they're told or the things that are likely to be told by other people, how is it going to affect what they perceive themselves as and what they're trying to do? Um, how to how to form that shape in all of its different dimensions, and then being happy with the fact that actually anything inside this space is totally great, uh, and how to s cut things that are relatively off limits or hard off limits, and certain things that are shining beacons that will attract everybody, and you just know it will. Uh, and so there's tons of techniques you have for defining all of those aspects of this space that you're making for people to play. So um, I'd like to follow up just quickly on that. <coughs> um, and maybe ask um, uh, anyone who's, who, who wants to in the panel um, to give me one example of a technique um, and what kind of interaction you feel would fall out of that technique. It can be a technique or a rule or what, you know, some, some mechanism of design, some artifact of design, um, and, and sort of the, the reaction and reaction in the game. Particularly about player empowerment? Or just but no, in, in general. So we started talking about player empowerment and in the answers, I was hearing a lot of discussion about um, uh, how to encourage uh, forms of play, um, because obviously that's about uh, player agency. I would like to just a few examples sort of to concretize those things. Maybe just think about one thing that you think that you have done or that you have seen uh, that would say, okay, if we, if I if I do if I take X design decision, then perhaps Y will happen, and that's how I can create some of those spaces. Just to ground it. A little bit out of the, the sort of like, you know. Um. Yeah. Um, we've run Battlestar Galactica a few different times, making tweaks here and there. Um, and it is, it, like I said, it's, it's about people talking about resource allocation and trust, and those are the themes we go with. And there's a lot of, there's mechanical stuff, like board gaming stuff going on, but there's also a lot of human interaction going on. So one of the interesting, interesting things that happened is that there's these pilots that go out and fight, and some of them decide to die when they're fighting and then they're given replacement characters, and they lose resources, but hopefully the missions they went on were worth it. Between year two and three, we made a very, very subtle change, which is that there was a way that the CAG could acknowledge the best pilot throughout the, the, the run. There was, a, there was an award they were gonna get. Teamwork went way down, and individual glory went way up. That one little change actually changed the entire game. Uh, because now the pilot unit is no longer working as a cohesive whole as much as they used to. They're talking like they are, but then you see the missions they're selecting, you're like, you're trying to win the glory. Um, that one little change 
changed that entire dynamic, which then changed the missions they succeeded on, which changed the resources that everybody got. The CAG was out of his mind and going to the guy who had other things to deal with and saying, ah, things are going horrible and I don't know how to fix it, and drawing tons of resources out of everything else that was going on. So one little change like that had all these ripple effects because it's human beings and I'm changing their perception of who they are and what they're trying to do and their incentives. Anyone else have any thoughts about uh, specific things that you've done that you think that you could point to them in action? Sure, sure. So I, uh, the, the, the comment about shape um, hits home. I design in triangles. Um, at the apex of the triangle, there's, some, there's a character who has to make a choice. And on the one side, the other side of the triangle, there's a person who's saying, yes, you should do this. And on the third side, there's someone saying, no, you shouldn't do this. And I build my games in terms of these triangles. Um, and when I boil it down, um, I have a game called The Tales of Urn, which is a, a tale-telling game. It's, it's a series of scenes, and they're, you, don't, you don't play the same character. You play a different character in each one of these scenes as it goes on. But each one of the scenes is a five-player <coughs> five player game. There is the protagonist. Um, there is that, that person who, is, who has this decision. And there are the two people, one who says yes, one who says no, and there are two other people who are advisors to one side. And they, they may have more of a gray, uh, a gray choice about which one of those things to do. And each scene boils down to some really important question. And uh, Tales of Earn is, is interesting because I was able to slip some very philosophical, very ethical questions into the mix and get my players to really think about the meaning of life and the value of a life and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> so these triangles, that's the focus of these things and they're very focused scenes. Um, I also, because there are a number of scenes in each one, um, I, there's a track. Each player has a set, a fixed set of characters that they're going to play in each one of these things so that everyone gets to be a protagonist in, in, in at least one scene. Everyone gets to be the antagonist, the one who says no in every scene. There's always someone who's, who's going to um, who's going to be an advisor or to, to one or, or, or those. And there's always going to be someone who may be a little bit of comic relief. You'll, you'll get a chance to play those parts during the game. So everyone has a chance to be the center of attention. Everyone has a chance to be the bad guy. Everyone has a chance to be the goofy one. You, if you have an answer, then we'll, then we'll go on. Uh, just a uh, sure. quick one. This is not my technique, uh, but it's a, it's a technique I think is a great experience. Uh, the liquor bottle on the table uh, from a lot called, called Screwing the Crew by uh, Tina Lindon and, and Neil um, There's a party. And the only rule is that when the liquor bottle comes on the table, which it's, it's usually put there by the GMs often or before the offense, after that people will say what they truly mean and you'll reach the climax of whatever conflict. And it also communicates that before the liquor comes on the table, it should be subdued, and after it has come, it should be uh, more aggressive play or more open play. And additionally, it draws on this thing that I don't know if this is universally true, but at least it's universally true in the regions because everybody has been to that party. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of know how to behave. Um, I have an answer as well. Sure. Yeah, of course. Um, thinking in terms of changes, subtle changes, um, where and how we put mechanics. Um, in um, my game Under My Skin, you're creating characters that are going to deal with um, possibly the uh, infidelities in their relationships. And so just the character creation, when I first created the structure, you just you know figured out what, where they were, where they worked, etc., etc. And then you chose at the end um, the core um, problematic emotional issue that was important in their lives. And I did a, a little pre-run with a friend, and he, he made the character, and he's like, I have no idea what to choose, I don't know what motivates this person, I, uh, I don't know how to jam that into what I've made. And then I just switched it. So you, you choose first that core element, and then created everything else, and feedback from other people to, to give you input. And, that, and the character just flows from that principle rather than Yes, you had a question. Yeah. Um, can you describe a, a moment in your design career where you were sort of forced to grow or just change drastically in like your, your mindset on how you approached uh, creating? All, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> if the answer is yes, that's fine. I guess 
my design style is I grab other people's ideas and love them and change them my stuff, right? So anytime I play something that has something that I've never done before, that was a completely new way of looking at it. And there's been so much of that in tabletop and LARPs that I've experienced over the past five, 10 years. That's when it really started exploding, 15, um, that it's hard for me to even pick one. And yeah, I, 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 I'm constantly having to grow and change and in response to some really brilliant things that other people are doing because I, I experience that and I'm like, wow, well, I, I can't believe, I didn't think of that. I can now see where this can go into 50 different places and have the same sort of effect we were talking about before. I, that is now, I think if I do that, it's gonna help them ground their character in some theme. Or if I do this, it's really gonna help provide a symbol to change the tone for when it's time to go from feeling one to feeling two. Like, I can use that now in a billion different places. So every time I play somebody else's game, there's all this stuff I want to do now. There's a game I'm working on right now that I'm trying to push myself. Well, second what you said, every time I play from a new tradition, I feel like my mind explodes and all these new possibilities become clear. g Farm did that, many others have done that too. Tale Telling, when I first encountered it, same thing. Um, and so after having encountered many different able to create many different communities and play with different people. Um, putting them together right now in a game that probably will be uh, edular oriented. Um, it's about John Milton and Paradise Lost. I'm a player here who is in it. So. Um, at any rate, um, thank you for playtesting that. Um, and my goal for that is basically to teach people a semester's worth of English history and literature in forms. <laughs> and then eventually I'd like to create a version that could be used academically. Uh, over a semester, um, maybe a, 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 a you know, weekend for students. I want to get some relationships with teachers. But it's challenging me in every single way, uh, mentally and physically, writing it and um, drawing upon uh, different techniques that were in a particular type of tale telling LARP where there was scene briefings for each of the characters that were available um, at the beginning of every scene. Um, dealing with the fact that you often do in LARP where you have many, many characters. And I, um, I forgot about to account for math in this case, where I had you know seven characters, and there were different uh, different options for this scene and two different types of scene, and then so writing the scene briefings for two different types of scene that could be chosen uh, based on two different directions it could go, and then seven for each. So I suddenly had like fifty character things to write, um, and so uh, I think some of the challenges are when you you try and innovate and you try and bring together different types of techniques and uh, uh, don't see down the road quite far enough in order to be able to get more support and have more time to do it. So it's been really rewarding, and I think uh, I'm really excited about going that direction. Uh, and Russ is still smiling, so obviously it's going okay. <laughs> um, but um, it, uh, it, it, it's, it's good. It's good to do those things and to work the next time to have more, more on your own. Uh, so I, I, I just want to say that uh, I echo the sentiment of go play other people's games. Um, you never know what you're going to stumble across. In, in my case, uh, it, it, it's never been a force to grow. It's, it's more a case of that's a really cool thing. So when I went to play Tales of Pendragon, which was the first tale-telling game I'd ever seen and played and had such a wonderful time, on the plane back, I started writing Across the Sea of Stars, which is my tale-telling game. And my choice to try and figure out how I could take that weekend and put it into 10 hours and instead of being Arthurian, use all the science fiction tropes and stories and things that I love. Um, and and um, Across the Sea of Stars has been very successful. A lot of people have really enjoyed the game. And I have taken from that and I've been writing Tales of Earn, it was a tale telling game. Um, um, a Second Chance for Wings, which we did at the Nelco Build Your Own Game, is a tale telling game. All trying to explore this space about how we can use games within games to advance a story, to tell a story, to focus in on a, on a particular point. Uh, that's one on, on the line about play other people's games. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I spent maybe the first active years of my block design career uh, as a bridge burning radical. Mm -hmm. I was a front man of the Dog 199 Collective. We wrote a manifesto, a very angry manifesto, about how every other kind of rock sucked, <laughs> including everything we had done in the past, and evils of the Anglo-American uh, role-playing game industry and so on. It's a pleasure to have you here now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the torches? Uh, 
And on one hand, committing to such a radical program helped those of us who were part of this uh, to kind of really innovate to, to get out of every box we've been working inside. And we learned a lot of stuff from that, including we, we learned stuff about what we shouldn't be doing again, ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the learning process. But we burned a lot of bridges uh, and cut us off from a lot of valuable sources of cooperation and inspiration. I think what you see coming out of the Nordic countries these days, like College of History and stuff like that, is the result that a lot of us have kind of grown up and realize that, okay, um, all this, uh, the buffer combat LARPs and the secrets and powers LARPs that we railed against uh, 10 years ago, they're actually pretty good. And there are some really valid forms of, of, enjoy, uh, of joy and design techniques that are going on there. And let's see like, what happens when we combine all this stuff. Uh, and then you get uh, big popular LARPs. So I've got a question about that, if I might. Um, don't you think that that railing and that sense that everybody else was doing it wrong produced a lot of new material that now other people can steal and use? If it hadn't been for that fury, would you have produced all these new ideas that, that can then be reincorporated and, and reintroduced? I think we could have been more diplomatic. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I think, um, I'm not sure. I mean, we were mostly in our early 20s. <laughs> you'd see the world differently with age, and maybe we would not have been as productive in our early 20s if we didn't have this righteous fury going on. Um, but we certainly wouldn't be as productive in our 30s and 40s if we were still motivated by righteous fury. Um, so I'd like to, I, I, I think some more questions, but I'd like to um, uh, shift to talk a little bit about process. Um, and so I'm gonna sort of uh, ask some pretty high level questions and people can interpret them in, in, um, as, as they wish. Um, but so there are really two questions I have about process. Um, first of all, how do you recognize that you have a good idea for a LARP? And um, secondly, where do you start? What's the first thing you write down? Um, what's, what's your entry point into the design? Um, what's your process for, 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 for saying, okay, now I, I have an idea, how do I turn that into a proto-design, an you know, initial design? So I, I uh, write with a group of people, um, and um, we've been writing together for a long time. And, and I, when I say writing together, it, it means I bounce ideas, and then I write things, and they give me ideas, and they tell me where I'm being wrong and being dumb. Um, and then I write things anyway, despite that. Um, and um, so that's usually the first cut at recognizing this good idea. If I can, if I can throw the elevator pitch at those those four or five people, um, and they say, yes, that's a good idea, I'd like to play that, or no, that's a terrible idea, I don't want to play that, um, that gives me some sense of going on, uh, of what to do. Now, on one hand, when I pitched across the Sea of Stars at them, um, they said, no, that can't ever work. Um, fortunately, I proved them wrong there. Um, but um, it was still good feedback, because I needed to know how to pitch the game and how to tell that story. Um, the first thing I write down is that elevator pitch. What is it that I'm trying to do what is it that, uh, that story that I want to tell? What kind of questions are each of the characters going to have to ask in there? Um, I started off writing, um, I would write the character and say, oh, I've got, I've got this character for, in the band, he's a drummer and he's this, this, that. And, and I realized it's really easy to write characters but not have them have anything to do or not be connected to the game. And so I said, oh, I'll write starting from the plots and go that way. And, and that has some of the same challenges. So it, it, I've sort of gotten into that middle ground of what's the rough outline? Um, I have a whiteboard in my living room that's been there forever even though it doesn't really fit in the living room. Um, and it has signs and arrows and pictures and drawings like that. And every Tuesday night we get together and we uh, eat cheese, drink pork, and talk about LARP and, and modify the things on the whiteboard. I like that whiteboard. <laughs> um, I think for me, when I <clears throat> hit a story that I feel both passionate about and um, committed to enough that I want to spend, you know, maybe a couple of years to um, and I feel like it has enough hooks in it that it could really grab and engage players, then I feel like that's, that's the, the beginning. And then once I've got um, an idea of a central or core or set of mechanics that are going to work with that, then I feel like it's an emotion, because until that point, it could be really a mess. Um, I came under my skin, I knew I wanted to write that, it was the third of the, these three romance games I was writing, I had this 
horrible idea about making people play out characters that are going to fall in love with the wrong person and then maybe you know throw up, screw up their relationships because I've seen it happen in my life over and over in various different social circles. And it's, it was dramatic. Um, and I kept thinking of it in terms of being a tabletop game. And um, it just like it was just a pile of ideas that didn't hang together. And then I went over to Finland and played some G-Form games. And I came back and was glowing and talking to everybody about them who'd listen, or perhaps a word. <laughs> uh, and uh, chatted with a friend. And she jokingly said, oh, yeah, you, your, your game under my skin, you should write that as a G-Form. Ha, 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 that'd be so intense. No one would play it. <laughs> <laughs> And then we laughed, <coughs> and then I said, wait a minute. <laughs> and from there, it literally was a day before I just saw the whole structure, everything came together. And eventually I used the other ideas that I had for the tabletop because I wanted to make it available both in tabletop and in LARP. It's actually a little bit harder to pitch LARP as a product, a published product. Uh, that's changing now, which is great. But, um, but the live action, that's what gets played. I mean, the tabletop has been played, but the live action, it works. And the reason it came together was Uh, okay, so very similar to uh, what Jeff said, I tend to start with an elevator pitch in my head. And the way I know it's something good is that I want to play it immediately. I, I would like it to appear out of nowhere, if somebody else could do it, please, and I would want to play in it. Um, and then sometimes it goes terribly wrong because then it's only me and three other people in the world who are interested in it, but that's at least it's something I'm willing to work on and I know the passion's going to be there and I'm going to be willing to put the work towards getting it to be something that's finished. Um, at that point, I tend to go towards what my constraints are, which is like different than what I've heard from you guys, so maybe that's just me. Uh, but I immediately, okay, this is going to be, um, I, I'm going to have this room that I know I can run it in, or I have these people I know who are going to be interested in it. So it's going to be eight people. Um, it's going to be every people already trust each other, or whatever those constraints are. In the case of the presidential library one, it's okay, it's a classroom of teenage kids. Um, it is at the Reagan Presidential Library. People will be coming in and experiencing this once. They're going to talk to other people about it. There's going to be PR implications of everything that comes out of this. And I'm, I'm listing these out and keeping all of this in mind. And then and only then do I go into, what do I want the people's individual experiences to be like? And I, I kind of tend to focus then on person to person. You, I know that, you know, historically there was a White House Chief of Staff who was disconnected from the decision-making process. Is that interesting for you? <laughs> is that a thing that is a part of this game or not? Um, if I can figure out a way to make that cool for you, then I'm going to write that down as potentially a thing that you will be doing. And in cases where it's symmetric, I'm thinking about holistically, what are people doing in general in this game? And is that interesting? Are there techniques I can get in there so that they can invest it with their own agency and their own creativity? And are there techniques I can get to shape this thing towards the direction that I think the entire thing is now starting to go? Um, and then from there, it's a matter of just worrying it to death until I actually feel like it's okay to show trusted people what I'm doing. Physical design process is still a mystery to me <laughs> when it comes to lot design. Um, uh, or the kind of, I mean, we can talk about theory, but what do lot designers actually do? What actually happens in our heads when we work is still not really clear. But for me, the, the resonance that um, lot design is communicative. If you can't communicate it to your players, it will not happen. If you can't communicate it to the GM who's going to run it, it's a great example. So uh, a big part of the design process is discussing ideas with others. And a big, big part of what happens there is also this kind of non-verbal, do they get it when I talk about it this way? What do they think? And so on. So for one lap I worked on, this was a happier one, uh, mm -hmm. um, rock and roll musical. Uh, we, we had only half an hour to brief players. We knew this. <laughs> and they wouldn't know anything in advance. So we took the script, uh, there was a, like a growing organizer committee. We started with one person, then we were three, then we were five and so on. Every time there was a new person, we did the, we did the pre larp introduction to the new person. This is how all players will be welcomed. <laughs> and then we asked, do you have any questions? <laughs> and then those questions mm -hmm. kind of told us what we needed to clarify. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe they got the complete the wrong idea from, from our introduction. So then we could adjust it to give the right idea. So we have uh, we have about half an hour, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have some more questions. I can continue to walk through the through the process, but um, if there are questions from the audience, so all the games that I've run have been in other people's systems. Like I 
I haven't designed systems, I have chopped systems apart, but that's different. And when I run a game, it's always kind of around set pieces. Like, I know I want this scene to happen and this scene to happen, and how they're going to get from one to the other is going to be a lot of up to the players, but it, I'm wondering if that's... Do you start with that image in your head of, I want this encounter, I want this scene, I want, you know, this person betrays this person, or is it more thematic in, in your design? Um, in some, <coughs> some types of mark, you re at least for me, I really do start with that. Um, freeform uh, style arcs where you have a set scene, yeah. um, particularly if it's one where you really know oh, it's a very tightly plotted scene um, storyline, then uh, like the, the milk one literally has scenes where there's life that people can play out. So there it really does start with that. Um, and if it's not that tightly um, plotted, for example, if it's a larger, a more traditional synchronous play lark, or um, it's a, a, the type of freeform yeah. where people are going to make their own content just within a theme. Um, then I just want to make sure that there's enough tools that people can um, come to agreement about what kind of scenes they want to play, um, whether it's picking techniques, like the morning in the row, and um, play with intent is a, uh, it's a, I can describe it, it's a system, a customized system toolkit that I wrote with a, a Norwegian friend, um, uh, Matisse Walter, um, who, and uh, <coughs> the idea that we have all these techniques we're in from, who are in tabletop design, why don't we just create them as a structure that people can choose a few to play with, maybe grab one as you go, and then have agreements that help you get from one place to the other. Um, so, uh, and then, yeah, it's a little, it's, I think that these folks can speak more to the types of shaping and molding you can do in the um, more traditional style works, because that, I think that's really tricky. That is the place where Dogma 99 seems appropriate. You know, it's like, is this, I'm the writer, this is my idea. I want to make sure that you're standing on this rock at 3 o'clock, and then it might be a matter of consent. Uh, if everyone knows that at 3 o'clock there's someone who has to stand on that rock and make a speech, more power to you. But if you're like shaking behind the scenes, it can be more uh, difficult and problematic and more argument. That's how it is for me. So when it comes to, when it comes to scenes, it, we have to be careful about the terminology, right? So. Um, in Tales of Urn, there is, uh, you know, there is a there is a question about um, what the there's what the story is going to be. Right. So the first scene is the death of this important person in in the scene. It's a funeral. It's there's you know they're they're trying to figure out what they're going to do next. Um, but that's as far as I go with describing it. If, if if you're talking about a scene as in character A and character B are going to have a knockdown drag out fight in the middle of everyone at this time roughly, I don't do that. Um, when when I was writing, I, I started writing murder mysteries. There was one thing that had to happen, and it had to happen the way you wanted it, which is the murder, because otherwise, otherwise the detective doesn't have anything to do. It's not correct, and even just getting that to work was crazy. And there were times <clears throat> when, it, when it would be stop him from going around that corner, stand in his way, because otherwise he'll walk into the murder scene, and we don't want that to happen. Um, and so when you try and, 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 and if you try and make that scene happen, if you try and force that scene, it, it, you, you, you start doing things that are not good for the game. You start trying to, um, to stop those players from going to that place or whatever. Um, so uh, again, I, I will frame the scene and let the players go and see what happens. Now, Tales of Burn, as I said, it's a five player game. It's a very intimate game. Uh, the game has run 23 times now. I've run it probably 10 times myself. And it has never run the same uh, in all the times I've watched it. And I've seen, I've seen brilliant play that pulls different things out of those things. I don't want to stop that from happening. I want to let that happen. So I try not to make right. it, force but, it. But when you, when you created it, did you have an image of this is what's going to happen here? Even if that doesn't, isn't what actually happens, is um, that part of it? I, I, I have a scene that says, here's the question they have to ask, all right? And and I have a thing how I would play it, and, and you know it's a game that I would love to play that I wish someone else had written so that I could play it. Um, but um, I, you know, if if that doesn't happen, I'm fine with it. I, I like I said, I've seen some brilliant play out of it. Um, yes. The 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 answer to your question is it really depends upon what the intent of the thing is and. Very often, unless I know the players involved, I'm designing from a very selfish aesthetic, so I'm thinking, would I want this done to me? Um, we both played in Indian. Mm -hmm. 
being told you're this person, you're feeling this, and this is the exact same thing was completely fine for that game. I loved right. that. Because what I was trying to get out of that was engage with the literature and be there, right? If somebody had done that to me and something that was sold as a more sandbox reform experience, I would be angry. Um, <coughs> so it completely depends. It totally depends upon what that piece of art is attempting to accomplish. And a lot of times what I do is I say, would I want this done to me? I was writing a LARP, and in the middle of it, I realized that if I was this character, I would put me in jail and watch me for two hours. And I said, that needs to change. Because I would screw up this game. And so all of this needs to be, needs to be changed. Because that's not what the game was about. If that game was, that, was about that, then I would have been perfect. That's gonna, exactly going to be what happens. OK. Um, so the next question is a, is, a, uh, is, a tricky, is a tricky question, I think. Um, but I'm going to ask it very simply. Um, you had your idea and you got started with designing. How do you know when you're done? I'll jump in. <laughs> when it keeps working. Oh, cool. Um, I, I don't write games that are intended to be played once, typically. So that isn't everywhere. A lot of LARPs, you play it and you're like, oh my god, we need a crew. <sighs> okay, let's start the next one. Um, but for me, um, Just follow up then. How do you know if you've been successful? If what the people are saying is generally positive and is in the ballpark of the type of experience that I was hoping they would have. Because um, you're sort of doing experience design, right? The phrase that you'll use. Um, and so we have a vision. I think actually that's what I would answer your question with. Rather than having a scene, I have a feel in mm -hmm. mind and an experience that I want people to have um, within this, this story frame. And then if that's not happening, then I have to keep working on it. And I have a few games that I, I'm still working on them, but I'm still like not sure that the, those mechanics are, are, even though people are enjoying the game, for me, it's not it's not giving a consistently the right type of experience I can. So, um, yeah, and also, and also, I don't know, you feel in your gut, oh yeah, yeah, nailed it. <laughs> Which is totally a useless answer, but uh, hopefully you'll have that feeling. And so how do you um, elicit that feedback? And do you do anything in the design to make it easier to get feedback? Um, that's, that's something I'm thinking about a lot right now. We did a problems and learn um, talk the other day. It was a round table as well. Because we feel like assessment is an area where it's, it's easier to, to not <laughs> take, to do it. Um, there's a great um, uh, design uh, conference called Metatopia that's done in November, hosted by Double Exposure. And that's one of the places where what everyone be there for the same reason, which is to talk about and to help each other design new games. And um, for that purpose, I, I took um, two games and one ran three times in playtest and made little surveys to everyone. Um, and that was really helpful because although I talked with everybody afterwards, it's actually different what people say when they write and what they say to you. Um, and in the moment, you don't have different emphasis. Uh, yeah, at each moment, they give you different information. So uh, I think I would definitely do that again. Um, and, um, but, you know, it, it's interesting thinking about LARPs. If people are playing, um, do we want to get feedback from them while they're playing? Because their feelings then might be different than after the game. Um, yeah. Sorry, I know there was a whole bunch of questions yeah. in there, but basically, the base question is still, sure. how do you know when you're done? So how do you know you're successful? Most of the stuff I've written has been one shot for a convention, so I'm done when I've run out of time. And I'm damned. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've had one, I've not nearly as much experience being able to iterate over things as say you have. I have had that one experience of being able to iterate over the EduLARP. And there I robbed heavily from my experience in electronic gaming, which is I can't take feedback on face value. And so the most valuable things to me are coming up with ways to sneakily measure whether or not they're actually engaging and enjoying the things that I want. So if I ask them, especially a bunch of kids that are standing here with teachers around, how was that? They're all going to say it was great. Uh, if instead I ask questions about what happened during certain times or why you made a certain decision, if they can come back with an actual reason and that jives with what they actually did, that person was engaged and made decisions and had the experience I wanted to. If they come up with some boilerplate nonsense, there's a black hole here and I need to figure out what to do about that. 
So I have had some instance in iteration, but I just robbed completely from what I do over in the electronic gaming, which is I watch people actually interact with the artifact and with my trained eyes see what's going on, and then afterwards ask them different questions than the ones you might actually think you should ask. Yeah, I'm also one shot designer usually, so when when we run out of time. <laughs> uh, but now rerunnable is, is uh, becoming a thing also what we use to design as one shots in, in the other countries. Um, and then I have to fight against the urge to read this up. With this uh, rock musical love I mentioned, uh, Tutti et Lied Love came in and, and uh, helped to run the first rerun. And then I was like, let's redesign everything. He had a bit more experience with rerunnable. Uh, <laughs> so I was like, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fix the very obvious flaws uh, and then uh, just see how the rest goes. And then I saw that some characters that hadn't really worked in the first run worked wonderfully this time. What some other characters? Mm -hmm. had worked wonderfully the first time, didn't work this time. So the problem was not necessarily the character, it was casting the communication. Uh, and then we could work with that further on. And then after five or six reruns, I started seeing the patterns, okay, this group tends to not have as much fun as the others. And, there, and we can speculate on the reason for that and, and start fixing that. So I really, I've come to appreciate the iterative and rerunnable approach. But it's hard with the, with the big form. Right, so I, I rerun my games all the time. Um, because having spent all that blood, sweat, tears, time, um, frustration, and lonely nights um, doing it, I damn it, I want to I want to get the payoff several times. And besides, if it's a good game, people are, will hear about it and say, "Will you rerun this game again, um, so that I can play?" Um, I, um, I I'm a little different. I don't bid a game, or I and sometimes I don't even tell people about a game until it's done. All right. So that, um, so that I think the game is ready to go and ready to be played by a group of people who, um, who I may not know um, or who I, I, I don't know who's going to sign up for it. Um, I try to, to get a play test or two in beforehand. So, um, so when I ran Tales of Urn, since I had been working with my, my, the group on the, the project, they knew too much, so I went out and recruited um, a different group of people to play test the game the first time. And I thought, this is going to run in two hours. It's going to be done. It's going to be over. And um, and uh, rented a hotel room at the local hotel, brought the people there and said, let's go. And when one of them looked up at the end and said, we've been playing for four hours. Um, and I knew that, I, that it was working, that it was a success. It was much longer than I expected it to be, but that was OK. Um, and then I apologized to my team for doing the secret play test and got them to play test it and see what was going on. And they brought other feedback. But that was about it. Um, when I ran Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll at Brandeis, it was essentially the same game that I wrote 30 years ago with its warts and flaws. And there are some in there. But it was good enough then. It's still good enough now that people had a great time. So I'm, I'm going to uh, ask for any questions. Uh, I was just wondering if you think about the writing process in terms of project management and whether you have uh, any sense of what helps you get from idea to uh, this is actually working as opposed to this is never going to be anything but an idea. So I, I start off, um, I, I, all of my stuff is written in HTML these days um, because I can write naked HTML faster than I can do anything else and because it's portable. Um, I almost lost my original LARPs to old formats expiring and not being able to be readable on a computer. I now have it so that I have all the material from all the games except for the hieroglyphic font in Idle Hands of Death, which I still have to figure out how to, to do it. And, and I'm looking at it going, what is the secret message that's encoded here? I don't remember, and it's not written down. Um, but, um, so everything is in HTML, everything is source control. All right, I'm a software engineer by, by trade, but, um, but I use source control to, to do version management to keep things in um, and, um, and use that so that I can see what's going on. Now, I don't use any larger, um, larger tools or anything, but I do keep um, on the home page, my internal GM home page, which has links to all of the pages in there, um, I track state. 
for various things. This character is in this state. This character is done uh, as a first draft. This character has an outline, it needs more, um, and, and do that. Um, and, um, and so I, I have this all visible to me um, in, in my way of organization. I could, I could pop open the page for the game and there's all of the details and there, you know, there's no link to that, to that page. Oh, I have to write that. There's no, you know, there's a note here that says you have to do X for this. Um, and so, um, so that's how I go about building it. There was a question there also about when do you give up on an idea? Was it uh, more? Uh, how do you make sure that the idea doesn't uh, flounder and never get anywhere? Well, um, to challenge one of those assumptions, I, I think it's really healthy to have a lot of ideas that flounder and never go anywhere. Um, and and sometimes you try and push something and then it doesn't actually really go through. Uh, but for the ones that are going to live that, that you love, um, I think it's a matter of. I don't know, I, I'm terrible. I have like a, a stack of notebooks that have little bits of the, the ideas in them. And, and I try and go through and make sure I don't miss anything. And so I think not doing that would be a good start. Um, uh, I, I started using Scrivener, which is really helpful um, for drafting. Uh, I've got a couple fans in the audience here of Scrivener. Because uh, it, it breaks it up into a book and chapter format. You can have notes, you can have resource materials in there. Um, I found it really helpful. Um, and then it, it's terrible. I, I, I'm going through this big process of, of revising my three romance games and, and putting them in one volume. So I've had editors now work on it. And I have it all nicely sorted in Scrivener. And then when we had to edit, they had to go back into a stupid Word file, which in order to get from the beginning to the end, you have to scroll forever and ever and ever. So um, there's just technical things that are going to be screwy no matter what. Uh, and I don't know how folks who write really, really intense long larks deal with just the massive amounts of information characters, background, Background yeah, it's thing. all in HTML, all on the web page, oh, that's and, smart. and there's there's a web page of the, that that points to all of those ideas and things that are there, that's smart. and they have a home page for each one. And you know, the the current secret project that I'm working on was an idea that my daughter pitched to me in 2003, uh, and it got a couple of notes written in, and all of a sudden, my son and I were in the car, and we talked about it, and all of a sudden the it, the switch hit us, and that's what we're working on now. Mark Justan Wax has just announced Quirky, which is his wiki-like tool. Uh, it's a database that's designed to do all of this and do it in a way that's easy to use. Um, so uh, I think we need to go. It's called Quirky. Q U E R K I. He's just gone into public to public release. Um, and uh, and he's written he's written his his last LARP using Quirky to do all of this stuff um, to keep track of all these relationships to all the gendered pronouns and all that sort of stuff. But so yeah, uh, don't do what we do, which is so. <laughs> if you do, it works out. It's all right. In, in particular, we have a 250-page Google Doc that's that way because it's collaborative with three people in different places in the nation one of whom is a screenwriter and used to using a particular piece of software he insists upon using. Um, and so I export the stuff from him into there and then go through. This sounds like a much more rational way of going yeah. about doing what <laughs> so, so, um, so And then spreadsheets, though. Spreadsheets are good. I'll always say spreadsheets. So at the New England LARP conference, Nelco, in the summer, um, um, we've been having this, this is the, be the fifth year, right? Yeah. Um, we, uh, we run a Build Your Own Game seminar. So, so the idea is that on Friday night, um, one of us gives a talk about how to write LARPs for the new authors and, and, and old authors in the group. Um, Saturday morning, we get, to get, uh, we get together and we start writing. We, we pick an idea and we, 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 we go and we run the game on, on Sunday morning, um, and, or Sunday afternoon, usually. And usually, we haven't slept along the way. And, but in that place, Google Docs is great, and Post-it notes are brilliant. Mm -hmm. Write write things on post-it notes and we have a whiteboard, a huge whiteboard that says, all right, here's this character. These plots go into this character um, and these, these are the items of this thing and this is the blue sheet and they have different colored post-it notes and, and they can do that. And, you know, post-it notes, the brilliant thing about it is, oh, that's not right for this character. This has got to go in here. And, uh, and it just works. Um, and, uh, and actually I've documented a bit of that process on my website and I can 
So we can get a pointer to that. Sure. Just, just to interject, uh, if you guys have not seen Trello, if you're used to using Post-it notes, Trello is Post-it notes and lanes and stuff that's usually used for software project management. But mm -hmm. That is another great piece of collaborative yep. software. So Trello. T R E L L O. I have I happened to stumble into using that because it was used professionally, and then the same guy I was working with over there said we can use this for this little mini thing we're doing. And, and Evernote, I, you know, if I have a LARP idea when I'm on the road or somewhere, you know, yeah. put it in there and I've got it on all my machines. Evernote fans also. Yeah. 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 Right, so we have um, just a few minutes left. We can ask one last uh, question. It's, it's a two part question. Uh, uh, it, it's really, this is sort of the, the, the wrap up thoughts sort of section. I'm just going to prompt you with something, but you can, you can go off and say what you want to say or something that I've missed or, or you feel is really critical. Um, so my question is, what do you think is the most challenging and the most critical parts of web design? Okay. I can risk your walk quickly thinking about more thoughtful <laughs> answers. Um, the most challenging thing for me is to try to think like other people. Because anytime you're making something that's going to be intended for use by people who are not you, you need to try to put yourselves in their shoes. Are they going to enjoy this? What are they going to do when they're presented with this? I can more easily put myself in a bunch of positions and decide what I would do there and that I would enjoy that, but maybe somebody else would not. And so for me, the challenge is always trying to, and I model people who I know, what would she do here, what would he do here? Um, and the bigger collection of people I get, the more I can kind of use them as, as pawns, mental pawns in my game of, of imagine how this game would go. Um, the most critical thing in design, I think, is to is is actually to do that thing, uh, which is to consider how the actual people are going to interact with the thing that you've made. Sometimes there's a trap in my in my mind. There's a trap that you can fall into, which I've put the rough label of simulation by default in there, which is I'm going to make a thing about a spaceship, and so spaceships have this and this and this and this and this and this and this, and space travel is this and this. So obviously all those things go in there, and if I model each one of those exactly the way that it actually works, this whole game will work. Sometimes that's what you want, but very often what you've just done is you've just thrown a kitchen sink of stuff in there that doesn't do what you actually wanted it to do. And so actually taking the step of considering how actual human beings will interact with this thing that you've made will then lead you to believe that you should take some things out or put some new things in or change what's going on. And so design is not simply modeling, it is modeling with the idea that human beings are gonna interact with it and trying to model those interactions as best you can. So for me, uh, you know, I'm writing this game and, and I'm writing it because I want my friends to have fun with it, I might want people I don't know to have fun with it so that we can become friends. Um, and so the challenging thing is to say, okay, is this, a, is this a fun role to play? It may be dark and depressing and, and really deep, but there are people who might want to play that, as opposed to, can I replace this, this character with an item card? All right, if I can do that, then that's a bad idea, right? I've done something terribly wrong, um, you know, I want players to have a good game out of it, and and so that for me is uh, is the challenge, right? And and that's why I want to play test it. That's why I want to have ideas. I want to have a team that I can bounce ideas off of, and that will say, "No, Jeff, you're being crazy," or you know, "Yeah, that sounds really good, but what about this?" Um, I tell you, driving around sun Saturdays uh, in the car with my son doing errands, he started off as a note taker for me. But then he started asking me questions. And he never plays LARPs, but he's read everything I've written. And, and he, then he started contributing to the point where he is one of the authors listed on Tales of Earn because he put that much good stuff into it. Um, to me, once you have that figured out, if you have a good idea about that, the most challenging thing to do is to make sure that all the character sheets and blue sheets and everything is consistent and match up with each other. Yeah, there's nothing that, that, that drives me crazier when a game, in a game where I, I, I go up to a character and I say, oh, do you remember about this thing that we did you know, five years ago? And, and you know, maybe that has relevance now. And the other character goes, five years ago? No, we, no. I don't know what you're talking about. That's probably a place where the GMs did not do 
the consistency checking, they didn't have an editor that looked over things to say, if it talks about five years here in one character sheet, it's got to at least mention it in the other character sheet. They may have very different interpretations about what happened at those times, but it's got to be in both places. And I'll tell you, you know, I, I keep finding typos and things like that 10, 20, even 30 years ago. I, I found a misspelling in sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It drives me crazy, but at least I know that I've had enough people go through that all of these things, they have those matches. Where it says something in one sheet, there's a match in the other. Exactly one minute every time. 